Uh, hey, everybody. Good morning. The last few minutes of the morning. <clears throat> How's everybody? Hope all is well. What's it like being racist? I'm not a racist at all. I'm an anti-racist. I helped organize Black Lives Matter rallies. Uh, I'm not a racist. I marched in the streets. Liberals can debate. For sure they can debate. Absolutely. A lot of times if you come to people with respect, they'll come to you with respect. No, I don't support Trump. But there's a difference between being a liberal and a leftist. I'd rather speak to open-minded liberals. How are you all doing? Nick, how are you? Red Fire? Red Fire! I love that name. Okay. Well, I'm not a racist. So, I'm not just not a racist, I'm an anti-racist. So, I guess you could talk to me. I hope you are also anti-racist. I hope you're not just an ally, but an advocate as well, especially if you are not a person of color. Absolutely, there is such thing as white privilege. I know I have, I'm not white actually, uh, I'm mixed. I'm half Latino, half white, so I am brown. Um, but even with being mixed uh, comes with a certain amount of privilege, I understand. Um, but that's why you have to be an advocate for people that are, that have received decades of uh, marginalization and oppression within the United States of America. Who don't claim me? I'm mixed. Uh, so I, I think, you know, what's funny is when you say people don't claim me, when you are mixed, it, you kind of feel like that sometimes. Like, you don't, I'm not Turkish, no, I'm half white and half Latino. But when you're mixed like that, sometimes it does feel like that. Both groups don't claim, don't claim you. I've, I've felt like that. Um, you know, you're not white enough to be with the white people and you're not Latino enough to be with the Latinos. But I speak pretty good Spanish and come on, okay. Ozzy. All right, let's talk. I think we've spoken before, Ozzy. Did you fight in the Armenian War? <laughs> Ozzy, what's up? Yo, what's going on, man? Hold on a second. Hold on. Give me like two seconds. I'm half white and Hispanic. Oh, just like me, Joseph. <laughs> I think I've been in here before. I think we've been here before, but it's nothing much yourself. So. Yeah, uh, I, think I think we I've did been... speak before. Huh? Yeah, I think we did speak. Yeah, but I think you got to go and do something. Um, I think the last time we were discussing the topic of like socialism, communism, and capitalism. Right. Yeah, that, I don't. I don't remember where we finished off. But what do you? What are you? What are you debating today, or what are you discussing? Same stuff, same stuff. I like I like talking about economics, world politics, world history, uh, foreign policy, uh, war, imperialism, stuff like that. I, I try to stay away from the the momentary bullshit that so many people talk about. You know, people are talking about COVID and vaccines and and all this nonsense um, that's happening at this present time. <clears throat> um. I think the the last yeah, time we Colin actually Powell remember... died, uh, he shouldn't have died of natural causes. No, I'm just answering someone in the comments. Oh. So what's up? So I think last time we were discussing, I remember now we finished off on Venezuela, Cuba, because so I think we were talking about we were, we were talking about socialism, but we were talking about how it's 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 not necessarily the full thing. Is it? Oh, I think we were talking about Cuba, because you had said that you'd been to Cuba, or you knew somebody who was from Cuba, and I had said that. No, I've been there, and I, I, I've been there, and I have friends there, and I have, uh, I'm in contact with them. I, I know, I, I've, I know quite a bit about what's going on there. 
<clears throat> yeah, because I had told you that there's from that country, and then they usually go for a conservative vote, but not because of Trump, because of capitalism in itself. They like the rations and, you know, the percentages of capitalism, right. not the full set capitalism. And I would have to, like, so I think my thing would be, I think the first thing we should look at is, like, every time I've debated somebody, it's usually, I like debating socialists, because in between socialism and capitalism, they're, they're not really, this, there's nothing the same about them, because one of them is voluntary. The other one's really not voluntary. It's more of, it's how you... For, how voluntary, you, you mean? Yeah, it's more how you contribute to society and not putting in. If you're not putting in, then it's useless. This is, I think, why, like, the nationalists, like, Socialist Party, like, the Nazi Party, uh, the okay, the Soviet Union and stuff like that, like, right. Leninism, Marxism, like, both of them. But see, I know Karl Marx, I, I started reading the Communist Manifesto and a book called The Gulag, but throughout both of them, it was kind of like, there was, huh? You, you started reading the Manifesto? Yeah, but I couldn't, there's just, there's too many contradictions in the book itself. Like, the book is a huge contradiction, and like, I, one of the How biggest How big is the book? Huh? How is big is the Communist Manifesto? You said how big is the book, like page wise? Yeah, 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 yeah. I think it well, was a paperback about, copy. Tell of me the about Amazon. that. Huh? Yeah, it's basically like a, a small pamphlet. It's not a book to like having started reading. It, no, no, no. no. So the original Communist Manifesto is like the showered book, but it's like it's the book was like it was explaining like the theory behind Marxism and how his instead of communism was like it could work but in reality it's not going to work for one you have so i think but what like you didn't of, read the whole thing no because i didn't i stopped it was just there's too many contradictions in the book itself like what one of them was he was explaining like exploiting workers but then at the same time he kind of agreed and said like well it's voluntary work but it's not really exploiting how can you exploit something if you volunteer for it that's like saying like, if I went to go get a job and I said I was exploited, knowing I could have quit or stayed at that job, that's why I didn't understand that book for a minute because it's like this dude contradicts himself so much in that book. Uh-huh. I think that it might have been, uh, if I could say respectfully, it might have been a misunderstanding because the foundations of socialist ideology is, is based on something called dialectical materialism. And understanding that life is full of contradictions and con re contradictions within the material world and understanding those contradictions and how society and history is moving forward based on contradictions and conflict. So yes, it, it acknowledges that within everything there are contradictions and there are conflicts and there are conflicts between the workers and the ruling class. But now there is a contradiction. So there's a contradiction between workers and the ruling class and the capitalist class, like the owners of the company. Because in one sense, the worker is not enslaved. The worker is not forced to go to work, right? No one has a gun to their head. They're not officially enslaved like in the transatlantic slave trade. Although the United States was a capitalist country that had slavery. That was under yes, capitalism. I mean, every society has reasons, had slavery. Every every country had slavery so i think that kind of argument is like it's kind of far-fetched you know what i'm saying because it's but like the difference yeah, between the capitalism but had the... slavery but every country's had slavery in themselves but there's a difference between the transatlantic slave trade and what slavery was like in the far past because like slavery under roman empire and all these empires slaves were actually looked at as as like captured people they have to work for a certain amount of time and then they were freed they were not looked at as inhuman the way they were in the transatlantic slave trade. They were looked at as beneath. And that's what capitalism does. It creates even more of a hierarchical system and that these people can be viewed as not human. So okay, that's but... why the transatlantic slave trade was different. But let me just say one more thing about capitalism. So the worker is enslaved, you know what I mean? Because we even had things like company towns um, all over the Midwest and Appalachia, where we also had slavery of white people as well. Um, 
And that was almost as brutal, if not as brutal, as the transatlantic slave trade. So the worker has not got a gun to their head, they're not chained. But there's nothing voluntary about capitalism for the worker because the, cap the worker owns nothing, okay? They don't own the means of production. The worker many times does not own their house. They own nothing. So and let me they go and they question. produce every... Hold, let me just finish. I'll be done in one second. So the worker goes to the workplace that is owned by the, the capitalist. The land is owned by the capitalist. Everything that they produce is given to the capitalist. What they produce, the value of all of that labor is given to the capitalists, and they are, in response, given a wage. And that wage is as, as small as possible. And in right. our society, we've seen wages rise, and we've seen worker protections rise, but that wasn't due to the generosity of the capitalists or the state. That was due to workers organizing and fighting for those improvements in working conditions and pay, and many times those those improvements came with violence, with workers organizing uh, and many times fighting violently and dying just for the eight-hour workday or the seven-day seven work week and things like that. So one of, my favorite, one of my favorite sayings in history is that the obedient must remain slaves. The disobedience must remain free. And that's how society works. That's how we get not necessarily what we want but what we need and what we need to strive mm -hmm. in a society and to be able to live <clears throat> amongst each other and be able to produce what we need. So like I heard you say a minute right. ago that, you know, the workers, they bring for this capitalist, right? I guess you're, when you say capitalist, I guess you're referring to Jeff Bezos or somebody that runs that said company, but it goes like this. Yeah, I'm not so, talking about like a defender of capitalism. Yeah, yeah, I know, I know what you mean. So like, let me, let me say like this. So if I work for a company Okay, let's say me and other five dudes are making gunpowder. Here's an example. I say gunpowder. If one of us quits the job, it's gonna go. It's gonna slow down the process. He's not gonna be able to make enough money, right? There's not gonna be. He's not gonna be making the same. He's gonna realize that he's gonna need another worker, right? If all those four other workers with me quit, he's not making no more money. So, to, yeah. like to say that. Even if, like, with us, that's not that's not his. We don't control it. We do. The workers control everything. That's why we're having a huge shortage of workers right now. The whole like, yeah, the whole identity of well, like, if the workers can't control it, which that argument kind of fails because like it's the workers. Because if all these workers quit, they don't make any money or product. So therefore, that business is going to fail or it's going to crash because they have nothing to go on. What you just what you just explained is that all profit is generated by labor. Correct. And that that's, is that's one of our foundational it's labor ideas. Underneath. It's it's either labor from the person who owns the business himself, or it's, per it's labor by the people who work for that set of business owners. Right. And what Marx was talking about in the manifesto was that we are given, in, under capitalism, we are given the illusion of choice, we are given the illusion of freedom. Because we're not in chains, but we are. We're, we are in chains because, although they said this is voluntary, but what is, the, what is the alternative to not selling your labor, to not being literally commodified? Because under capitalism, the worker becomes a commodity in himself. So, and the alternative is starvation and death. So that's a no, because to say that like you starve in capitalism, you, you really don't. Because I mean, there's no there's no ration. Because if if you're homeless, it's kind of on yourself because you go and get a job no matter what the job is. So even if you work at McDonald's making, they make like sixteen dollars an hour now just to flip a burger. I mean, so I mm -hmm. guess a good example would be like. So let's say a man's working for a business, right? And he stops working for that business collectively, making $22 an hour. When he stopped working for that business, he knew what was going to happen as soon as he did that. I think anything above $21 an hour is more than, like, comfortable to live in this society. You don't have to so? have a big house to prove to be by everybody. You don't have to have the next car. You don't have to. This society is also saying that capital doesn't work because a lot of them aren't appreciative of what they have. It's not about... What you, what I can get or what I it's about what I need. That that's, you think that's at sixteen dollars an hour, a family's basic needs could be met. I didn't say just for the whole family, just for the father or the woman of that family. It's supposed to be a two people thing. 
not everybody can sit in their house they both have to work right money. yeah that that's how society should work that's the embrace that's how food. it's been for the last 40 years right. right i mean but 40 40 years ago and before from the new deal up until 40 years the idea of work was very different and you know remember the show the, the married with children and al bundy worked at a shoe sh uh, at a, a shoe store and they lived in this this big house in the suburbs and his wife didn't work and you watch that show and you're like wow like that's how it used to be 30 40 years ago when one parent could work in some retail job some low paying and and they could feed their family we we don't even think of that as normal right now now we say both parents got to work they got to work hard a lot of times they work two three jobs my i have a cousin who lives in florida his his girlfriend his fiance works at Disney and she works at an Amazon warehouse and she's still barely scraping by. And that's the reality for a lot of workers. And that's where things have gone in the last 40 years since the implementation of neoliberal economic policies started with Reagan. And this is normal now. And we think of so these think people as not deserving more. It also has to do with the parties that run into political power of corruption, as I said before. Capitalism is a great society that's run by corruption. So I guess an example would be like 40 years ago, you know how you said like, man, there's a dude working, it's a happy family. That's all they needed, you know? Plus whatever, like going to Disneyland and stuff like that from that movie. But it's mm -hmm. like this, it's like, yeah, those people are doing that in that society because the people who ran the power back then, the political power didn't use the corruption to tax them to death, to make them their living uh -huh. unaffordable. Because no matter how people want to deny it, President's policies do affect how we live every single day and how we use our money and how we are able to afford things. Because I've seen like a lot of people deny the fact that Joe Biden is raising inflation high as can be, which he is. No matter how they want to deny it, it's not supply and demand. It's the same man who runs it, you know? Mm -hmm. But I think capitalism yeah, is so great. It's just corruptly run. So therefore, people attack it instead of thinking about how we get rid of these certain people in the political power or the establishment, we have a better system in itself. But the, the fact is, is that capitalism is a system designed to be corrupt. And that's how it was designed Any in the very beginning. Any system is corrupt. It's Every not that it's a... Communist, but, socialist, but like the, the Nationalist the, Socialist Nazi the, Party the, was literally corrupt. That, that's, of course, but the Nazi Party was a, a form of fascism. So that's why. I mean... And we can go on a whole thing about fascism and what that means. Um, but the, the fact is, is that under capitalism, it's a system that is meant to be controlled by a ruling capitalist class. And it's meant to have a division of classes and a hierarchical system. And that if but we had a socialist system, and, and well, let me just say one more thing. Throughout Marx's writings, he discusses everywhere Everywhere, and this is the difference between people that have read this stuff and people that haven't. Everywhere he talks about that under socialism, it doesn't mean the end of corruption. It doesn't mean the end of, of conflict between classes. But it is an effort to end corruption. Corruption is not intrinsic and, and uh, in, interwoven into the system. Okay, like capitalism is a system based on the corruption. It is a system where the, the state is only a tool of the ruling capitalist class to use against the working class. It's based in that. So, of course, we know under socialism we would still be fighting corruption. But it's not based on that corruption. Right. So you had said something that kind of just hit out to me a minute ago. You had said that no matter what, like Karl <clears throat> Marx said, there's still going to be corruptness in the society. So... I mean, I'm thinking how far along the line is he talking about in that book? Like, how far until we actually get to a society where these people are thinking of, like, everything's just going to be fine, everything's going to go back to normal, we're living our daily lives. Because if, I, if I'm correct, and from the definition I've read almost three different times, socialism is the means, like, means of the workers. They cause the, the production, okay? Now, so, if that, with that being said... How is that going to be regulated? Who's going to control that? If I get more than him, if I'm doing more than him, if I'm going to make more than him, because it's supposed to be an equal society, but that's where the economic calculation problem comes in. Cause it's like, nobody's controlling this. Nobody's regulating this without the like high, mm -hmm. 
higher powers controlling or taxing me to death of what I own. Yeah. Or what I'm controlling. Okay. There's a book that Marx read, uh, he, that Marx wrote called The Critique of the Gotha Program. And in it, he talks about what you just discussed. And it talks about a lot of the misconceptions that people have and misunderstandings that people have about what he had previously wrote. And one of the criticisms that he talks about is that people thought he was saying that everyone would be equal. And now there, there would be equality of outcome. And Marx and Engels constantly discuss that they are advocating for equality of opportunity, not of outcome. Under socialism, we want everyone to have the equal opportunity to have work, to have fulfilling work, to have their needs met, to have clean water, to have clean air, to have housing. And that is the, that is the basis of what we believe because we have, even on this finite planet, we've mastered the ability to create abundance. We've mastered the ability to have enough food for everyone. We've mastered the ability to have housing for everyone. But the only thing that keeps everyone from being fed and being clothed and being housed is artificial scarcity under capitalism. Artificial scarcity keeps prices up and keeps people hungry, keeps people consuming, and keeps corruption in government happening. Right, so who's, who's going to control all that and make sure all that happens is planned? Well, in under a capitalist society, we'll no, 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 no. Talk about what you just said. What you just said. Who's going to control <clears throat> that abundance? Who's going to make sure we all got the same? Who's going to make sure well, that this is going to happen like that? So, so we have a state, right? We have a state now, and that's the difference between anarchism and socialism. In socialism, we would have a state that would rule by the rule of law. Everyone would be equal under the law. The state would be a means to make sure people had their needs met, to protect people's rights. Um, and it would also assist the, the economy in making sure that the workplace was being run in a fair democratic way. So when, you, when we talk about democracy in the workplace, we're not talking about or in the economy, we're not talking about, uh, I'm going to be, every worker is gonna be making decisions for the workplace. Like, we're not gonna be splitting up half the workday deciding every little thing, but just the way that shareholders vote on the board of directors, instead of shareholders who care nothing about the company, except for profit, the workers would be voting for management and leadership. And when that happens, we would have decisions made that would be, or much more than just raw profit. <clears throat> yeah, um, I'm about to I'm about to have to go here in a minute because I got to go to a meeting for work. Um, it's been a okay. good debate, man. Like I said, I'll get on here anytime and debate. I usually have time. I see you on here sometimes, but I'm not on here all the time. Yeah, well, thank you so much, Ozzy. And again, thanks so much for your questions and and uh, for the respectful debate, man. I hope you have a great yeah. day. You too. Okay. All right, guys. I thought this said libertarian, so I'll be going, but not before I say open borders. Yeah, uh, you know, the thing about open borders to me, and one of the biggest reasons that I believe in open borders, is that the U.S. was built on stolen land. And it's built on the genocide of an indigenous people. And many of the people or even most of the people that are trying to cross this border are indigenous people that were displaced by this settler colonial state. And they are trying to come back and migrate through this land that or originally is theirs. So this settler colonial nation should not be restricting the movement of people who are indigenous to this land. And for that reason, we should have open borders. And when I say open, people should be documented and, you know, whatever, checked. You know, Europe has open borders, and Europe is also a capitalist country. But there are people that live in France that work in Italy. There are people that live in Germany and work in France. They cross the border for work. They cross the border for going all over the Haitians. Yeah, absolutely.
I mean, when we think about what the U.S. did to, the, to, to Haiti, how Haiti had millions of pounds of gold the U.S. invaded, overthrew their government, and stole all their gold? Absolutely. <clears throat> we do have open, officially. Anarcho-communist here. What's up, anarcho-communist? I was just listening to Non-Compete today uh, on the way to the gym. It's one of my favorite YouTube channels. He's an ANCOM. I also like Luna Oi, who's his partner, and she's a Marxist-Leninist. It's a great YouTube channel. Check out, check out Non-Compete and Luna Oi. Great YouTube channels. Thank you for the follows, guys. Rock band or guitar hero. I don't really play video games anymore. Um, love Non-Compete. Yeah, it's fantastic. He's, like, funny and interesting and smart. He's, he's made some great, some great videos. I'm not one of these guys that only specifically watches like MLs or anything. I like all the different leftist YouTubes. There's so much like clashing between YouTubers. It's like disgusting. Just follow all of them and take, take what you can from uh, all of them. Because they all have something positive to share. I usually watch like YouTube on uh, like when I'm eating breakfast on my way to uh, before I go to work in the morning. Why does the Republican Party change from open borders to what they are today? Corny at, okay. The more people we allow in our country help us while causing more hurt in other countries. When I think of causing hurt in other countries, I think about all the small, poor countries that US invaded, <clears throat> in Latin America especially, our backyard, that the US has overthrown so many democratically elected governments, installed dictators, as a leftist, libs are the exact same as a Republican. Yummy, chunky, sour milk. I don't think that they are exactly the same as Republicans. I think a lot of them are afraid of going over that line in, into something that would actually solve our problems. Liberals want to defend the status quo because many of them want to keep their place in the socioeconomic hierarchy, but do want small reforms and improvements for different marginalized and oppressed groups, but they don't want to rock the boat that much. And, you know, we have something called the Overton window in this country that keeps people within this window of thought, okay? And when you go too much farther in one direction or the other, you're really thought of as an outlier, like a, you know, like an extremist. And there's a lot of pressure in our society to stay within this space of the Overton window. So a lot of liberals think what they believe is radical and they're advocating for people, but they don't want to change the system. They don't want to change the economic system that is causing the oppression. They just want, you know, minor reforms, but that's unfortunately not enough. I think liberals mean well. But they need to be more curious and, and critically thinking about the history of this country and that liberal reforms have been tried here and they just haven't worked. Band-Aid fixes on major problems, exactly. Liberals want to put a Band-Aid on cancer. And I get it. I'm a former conservative. I was a conservative until I was 22. I was a Republican. Then I was a liberal for many years. So I, I get it. Um, and that's why I want to have a conversation with them, especially if they mean well, especially if they truly want to make the world a better place. Let's talk about if these reforms and policies of supporting the Democratic Party um, is really going to improve things for everyone. And I think if, if they are open to it, they're going to find out that it's just not. We might kick the can down the road. We might maybe make things better for a couple of decades, and then things will return to the way they've been, or worse. Communism always fails. That's not true um, at all. Um, right now, Bolivia has cut their poverty rate in half. They've had a socialist party in power for the last 15 years about. Although the US backed a coup two years ago trying to remove the party and the president, they cut poverty in, in half. Literacy has risen. Education has improved. Um, but the US 
and uh, reactionary powers within are really trying to undo that progress. But socialism does really well until the U.S. invades or the CIA funds fascists to, you know, kill thousands of people within the country and destabilize their nation. <clears throat> So, hey, thank you for the follow. No, Bolivia just made everyone poor. Unfortunately, Dylan, um, that's not true. Uh, D Bolivia, if, I mean, you could search peer-reviewed articles, you can review journals. Um, it's, it's very clear that um, under the Bolivian leadership of the MAS party, the Movement for Socialism, uh, workers' rights, uh, democracy, uh, literacy, Healthcare have all improved. Um, they are in the early stages of a transition towards socialism, and they did it democratically. They did it through elections, which is pretty amazing. Um, and that's something that they've tried in South America for many years, but the U.S. has always invaded, attacked, um, you know, bombed, uh, committed state-sponsored terrorism like Operation Condor in order to destabilize these countries and the regions so U.S. companies can come in and um, the U.S. didn't invade the USSR, but the U.S. did commit economic warfare against the USSR. They were invaded by 20 countries. Um, we had something called the Cold War, which was meant the entire world was in a proxy war with the USSR to destabilize uh, the USSR. <clears throat> What's the difference between anarchism liberalism socialist communist leftism yummy chunky okay i'm gonna go really quick um anarchism is the idea that we would achieve a, a society without hierarchy communism and anarchism are very similar that we would achieve a stateless society communism is a stateless society with the absence of class anarchism is a stateless society with the absence of all social hierarchy it's a little bit more of a radical version. Also, anarchists do not want to take on the state when the working class um, overthrows capitalism. They want to immediately abolish the state, where socialists want to take on the reins of the state and control the state and use the state um, to empower the working class. And then eventually the state would wither away and we would have something called communism, which is a stateless, classless society. Liberals mean well, um, I would say, but they really want to maintain the status quo, giving a little bit more power to marginalized and oppressed groups. Uh, leftism kind of covers anarchists and communists. They're all leftists. They all want to empower the working class. Um, they want to overthrow capitalism because it's an oppressive, coercive system, but they have different ideas of how to achieve that. Um, <clears throat> I kind of was introduced to leftism through anarchism, but I think it's a little bit of a idealist idea that we could just overthrow the state. We don't want to create so much instability. Uh, I think that would create a lot of chaos and instability within society if we overthrew the state. Unfortunately, we do understand the state is a tool of violence. It's like having the ring in the Lord of the Rings, but we need to have the state power to create stability in order to also prevent reactionary forces from within and without to protect what we've achieved. <clears throat> Liberal is supporter of policies that are socially progressive and promote social wel welfare. Yeah, socialist, but promote so social welfare within a capitalist system. So there's a contradiction there, because capitalism is a, is a system that has a capitalist class ruling over a working class that uses the state as a tool of violence against us. So it just a, it, it contradicts itself. And I wish there could be a compromise between the capitalist class and the working class. Um, in the US, European countries have found a way to have that compromise um, more so.
between the working class and the capitalist class, um, that that progress was only for a few generations, like you know, from like the New Deal up until the late seventies, early eighties. All that progress was undone. The surfers don't care about the homeless or poor. <clears throat> um, look, man, I'm the biggest critic of liberalism. Uh, I think it's empty platitudes to marginalize oppressed groups and the poor, but many of them, I would say, do care about the poor. They just don't understand that their policies and ideas are not helping. And that's why I would like to speak with them about how we can really make change and empower everyone to make a better society. I'm going to have to leave for one second, guys, and uh, I'll be right back. Hey guys, and what am I going to do? One side says you don't matter, the other side says you matter, but shush. What is your ideology? Hey, I'm a socialist. Drawn by Ghosty. Yep. Hey guys, I'm back. I can only be here for a few more minutes. I hope everything's... Oh yeah, cool, thanks. I hope you all had a good day. I woke up. Um, took my wife to treatment. She's going through some health issues. I went to the gym. And, uh, and now I'm here talking to you guys. Hope all is well. I am a leftist looking to have a respectful debate with liberals or a conservative that is not too far to the right and not too uh, wacky. Um, I really don't want to speak with any of these conspiracy thank you for the roses um i'm just not interested in debating fascists um <clears throat> i'll talk about something so i was i recently was studying the the uh Yummy, chummy, so I know Tussie. Margaret follows my Good afternoon, my guy. What's up? Haiku relief. I'm going to talk about something real quick. The French Revolution had a huge impact on the world. Uh, it occurred right after the American Revolution. You have some questions? I will. You can ask me uh, remarkably. I'll talk about the French Revolution later if you want. <clears throat> I like going on my, my history lessons, but if you got a question, go ahead. Go 
Go ahead, guys. Okay, so I guess I'm gonna talk about my thing. So I was, I'm talking about the French Revolution, the impact it had on the world, on the West. Uh, not sure if I understand socialism. Seems to always be mixed ideas with liberal party. I would say that no. Um, and even in the United States, if you take the Democratic Party, uh, it would be, if you take, took it out and put it in any other developed country, like even the UK, the Democratic Party would be to the right, ideologically, of the British Conservative Party. The Democratic Party is a right-wing party. The Labour Party would blow it away um, in terms of ideologically on the political spectrum. Uh, it's only in the US that basic human needs and basic worker protections are thought of as something radical. Um, People try to enter at Bernie Sanders, AOC, into the Democratic Party, and they just get crushed by the powers that control the party within and without the party. Um, socialism is not, although they're nice, like, you know, uh, Social Security and Medicare, Medicaid, basic worker protections, that's not socialism. Conservatism and liberalism. Conservatism is just destroying America. Well, liberalism is watching it happen and not really putting up a fight. So I'm going to talk about the French Revolution real quick. Uh, I hope it's interesting to you guys. Um, so it occurred right after the American Revolution. And there were a lot of similarities. Re we remember France helped the U U.S. fight the English because the, France and, uh, Fran the French and English were enemies for many years. So right after they had their revolution and... It, they overthrew the monarchy just the way the U.S. did, but there was more things at play. The di one of the differences is that the, in the U.S., the ruling class really united the working class and peasantry to fight against the monarchy and not really question their own place in the hierarchy. And that's what, one thing we have now. Most Americans do not question their place in the socioeconomic hierarchy. They are oppressed, they are coerced, they are exploited, and they don't really even question it. And that's the way it was in the American Revolution. In the French Revolution, they overthrew the monarchy, and then there were two groups. You had the working class, which was called the Jacobins, and then you had the capitalist class, which was called the Girondin. And after they overthrew the monarchy, there was a lot of fighting for years between those two groups on who was going to take power. And it just extended and extended, and lots and lots of fighting between the workers and peasants and the capitalists. And at one point, they had uh, the Jacobins, the working class and the peasants, took total power of the, of the government. And they instituted a lot of worker reforms. They had something called the Universal Rights of Man, which was kind of like the Bill of Rights, but gave a lot more rights to the people. And... Um, they instituted something called the terror, which was basically going around killing capitalists, beheading them in the guillotine. And, uh, you know, they went too far. And one thing that they say, though, that economically, there was, it was the best times during the terror for the working class. But as happens in many revolutions, is that there's all this back and forth within and the working class, the Girondins, kind of imploded during the terror and they started beheading each other. The leader of the Jacobins, the working class, under the French Revolution was a man named Robespierre. And he ended up beheading like his second-hand man and the top people in the leadership of the Jacobins. And after that happened, the Girondins took power and then Napoleon took power and became a dictator, labeled himself a monarch, and became an empire. And at the same time, the Haitian Revolution happened, which um, overthrew French rule in Haiti. Um, and there's a lot of lessons to learn about the French Revolution. Uh, the terms right wing and left wing we get from the French Revolution. And the meaning of the words are the exact same as they are now. Some people want to change it, but we cannot let these definitions change. Right wing were the people who supported the monarchy, which thought we as workers are inferior to them 
And we should let this class of people who we believe are superior to us rule over us. They were right wing. The left wing wanted power to the working class, wanted power to the people, and believed that we could govern ourselves better than having a class of people rule over us. That there was nothing biologically or genetically or even, you know, uh, in any way superior to us. And that contradiction and conflict between right wing and left wing has, has remained there ever since. When you talk to right wing people, that's why even now you have a poor conservative right winger who believes that these capitalists and these uh, politicians who are billionaires should rule over us. And when you meet someone that's left wing, they want power to the working class and they believe that we could democratically and fairly govern ourselves. So democratic mindset is a disability changed my mind. We're not talking about the Democratic Party. We're talking about a society run democratically. But one thing is very important when we talk about democracy is that democracy in the hands of an uneducated population is a very dangerous thing. And that idea was started by Socrates, the ancient Greek philosopher, who was very, very afraid of democracy because he saw democracy in the hands of people that were uneducated and didn't understand how to think critically as the most dangerous thing in the world. And that's what we've gotten in the United States. We have a very uneducated population that elect leaders that don't represent them. So it's, it's very true. And when you have people that are uneducated, we also want to put the power in the hands of people that don't benefit us and don't represent us but represent the capitalist class. And that's why a capitalist democracy never favors the people. All federal elections are predetermined. I would say that the people who vote, the people who run in federal elections are definitely predetermined. The ruling class chooses who will be running in federal elections. Um, they're all wealthy, they're all millionaires. They all support policies that will only benefit the wealthy. And we really have the illusion of democracy, especially in the United States. Uh, we have the Electoral College, which has the final say. And you have to put up so much money in order to even run for election. So there's a lot of truth to that, but I'm not gonna say that it's completely rigged. Um, but there's a lot of different rigging within it that makes sure that they get who they want. So, yeah. Anyway, guys, I'm going to have to go. Sarah Milkes, not look at all current socialist, socialist countries. I don't think we really know. When we criticize socialist countries, we, we don't really know what's really happening in these countries in that countries that attempt socialism immediately come under attack by the United States. It's kind of a David and Goliath situation. And many of them achieve great things. Many of them have superior health care, education, and even the United States, despite hundreds of sanctions. So it's, it's pretty awesome. <clears throat> All right, guys, uh, I'm going to have to go for now but thank you so much um, follow me again I'm gonna try to jump on oh I got two guest requests thank you so much but I'm gonna have to go for now maybe I'll jump on again in a few minutes I just got to check on my kid all right bye